Hi, this is Manjula Narayan, books editor, Hindustan Times, and today I have with me, you know, Nantara Sagar. This is her new book, The Fate of Butterflies. Uh, I read it last night, and um, it was, I mean, it spoke to me about what's happening in our uh, nation, uh, you know, today. As you say, the book is about the times that we're living in. All my books have been about that. Um, how should I put it? My earlier novels, I've thought of them. as about the making of modern india this novella and the novella which came out a year ago are both about the unmaking of modern india and that is the time that we're living in and this story takes place against that setting that background you know when you talk about the unmaking of modern india i mean we 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 know um, uh, the nation's shift to the right uh you know which is becoming um i mean I- in the current scenario with um uh you know threats from the outside as well it's becoming more pronounced well uh manjula this is not only about a shift to the right in a democracy governments come and go they may be left wing they may be right wing what is happening now is a foundational shift meaning that we established at independence a secular democratic republic we did that because we are a deeply religious country that may sound contradictory but our founding fathers knew that the only way that every religion in india would be respected was to have a secular society where all religions would have equal status and the right to worship as they chose see that is under attack because the present regime would like to set up a hindu rashtra we have rejected a religious identity at independence and to now try to bring it back is going backward uh, instead of forward instead of belonging to the 21st century we are harking back to the middle ages yes. so it's more than a shift to the right it's we are at a kind of crossroads where india could go uh one way or the other either remain a secular democratic republic or under this regime uh, take on a hindu identity that's a foundational shift and as for threat from the outside that has always been there you know that in the in the 1960s pakistan had attacked at independence pakistan had attacked mm. yeah then in the 1960s we had a war w- with pakistan so that's not new that has been going on and um, added to that now is this worldwide um, uh terror where every nation rightly feels that that terror has to be fought so that but that is not new you know it's like the worst um uh nightmare of uh, of the independence generation right well it's a nightmare not only of the independence generation but for every indian except those who are following this um, political ideology called hindutva most hindus have rejected it and of course it is a, a terrible situation for the minorities we know that christian churches have been vandalized christians have been killed and of course muslims are the chief target and every day we are seeing them hunted down publicly on the streets you know mob lynched blamed for charged for uh, carrying beef when they are not doing so and all these things are making the minorities live in fear uncertainty insecurity and worse i mean what is worse than murder but apart from that all the hindus who won't fall in line with the ruling ideology 
are also being persecuted, harassed, and killed. Five well-known writers have been recently killed, the last being Gauri Lankesh. So all this is happening. It has not to do with the independence generation. It's what's happening today. And many Indians, millions of us, Hindus, are against what is going on. I think the book touched on all these uh, issues uh, very well you know, about the the shift in the way people are thinking as well and how difficult it is to hold on to a compassionate way of thinking and living. All communities have lived together side by side in harmony for centuries. And the hate that we now see all over uh, certainly North India, perhaps less in the South. I think that is a matter of indoctrination. There has been a campaign of indoctrination that Muslims are your enemies. They are foreigners, foreign. foreigners and enemies. And that they can only live in this country on sufferance, not as equal citizens. So you see, these things don't just happen. They are made to happen. And it is an exact replica of what happened in Germany under Nazi rule. The Jews were made the enemies. They were blamed for everything that went wrong. And the majority community who were not Jews were constantly told that you're in danger. And this is what is happening here that the majority community is being told you're in danger. Conspiracy theories are being cooked up. Mm. You know, it, it's a, an appalling situation and, and it's a total lie. Um, every dictatorship stifles freedom of speech. And the dictatorship that we have here now, I'm calling it that deliberately, because it is behaving like a dictatorship under cover of a democracy. Now, you know, we had, in my view, a dictatorship when the emergency was declared in 1975, but we knew where we stood. Uh, all the opposition had been put in jail. There was silence in the land because there was total censorship. Nobody was allowed to express a view. Now, that is happening today in different forms uh, under cover of democracy. The ruling party claims we are still democratic, but in any democracy, do you kill people who disagree with you? Do you stifle freedom of speech? Do you target one uh, of the communities of India, one of the religions of India? Do you, uh, you know, have mobs lynching um, Muslims on the streets. And these are not fringe elements which are doing it. These are groups of people who, are, who have the protection of the powers that be. Because not one has been caught mm. or punished. They are roaming free, doing what they like. Mm. So, I call it a dictatorship, and all this is happening, um, in, uh, which, is, which is what makes it such an anomaly uh, and, and so, so much more dangerous because you think you are living in a democracy, but you are getting no justice. Mm -hmm. Law and order seems to be in the hands of murderers. So you were one of the few writers who spoke up against um, uh, the Me Too movement. And, you know, uh, so if you could talk about that. I think I'm the only one. Yes, you are <laughs> the only one, actually. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> because I think other women seem to be afraid of saying anything in case they are judged as being against, you know, the whole movement. Well, I think the movement is a very important movement. And... You know, it's, it, it may well be time that it happened. I have turned against it, and I'm not supporting it. I've stood publicly against it because of the turn it's taken. In a democracy, 
nobody is guilty because somebody said so. Uh, that is not on. And that is happening. And I think the whole movement has become trivialized, sometimes fallacious. And it's altogether wrong that it should be happening in this way. You don't destroy a man because uh, of something you have said about him. He might lose his job, he might lose his reputation, he might lose his peace of mind. That's not on, as far as I'm concerned. And I do not believe in sex war. Mm. I believe that men and women should sit together at the table and discuss all these matters. And quite apart from that, I personally would like the focus to shift to the millions of helpless women who dare not speak. Yes. And just the other day, you know, there was a, under the auspices of an organization called Rashtriya Garima Abhiyan, mm. 5,000 uh, village women, Dalit women, were uh, led in a long march from Mumbai to Delhi. And then they were, had this meeting at the Ramlila Maidan. And the appalling stories of sexual assault, which they told are unimaginable, you know, quite different from what is now called, in quotes, molestation, which may or may not be anything to be bothered about. Mm. I mean, one example, and that woman told her story to the press, she was abducted outside her village home by a man who raped her for several days. He then sold her to a Thakur who raped her for months. After she escaped from that ghastly situation, she went to a police station. The police humiliated her in various ways and said they would not take down her story because there was no evidence. After that, she finally got back to her home and her husband and his family threw her out and said she was a dirty woman, she had eloped. Now, compare that with what we are, this me too, me too, me too, with every woman getting into the act in what I think has been an extremely, um, it's like a child shouting, me too, me too, you know, let me get into the act. This movement needs a much more serious title to begin with. But apart from that, it needs attention to these women who now, not centuries back, are still suffering in the way that this woman did. That's true. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, those are my reasons. And I don't care if I stand alone. You don't you stand know. alone, actually. <laughs> well, no, but others must speak. Nobody else has said so out loud. You know that song by Rabindranath Tagore, Eklo Chalo Re? Mm, yeah. If nobody walks with you, walk alone. Well, that's what I'm doing. Literary festivals have uh, uh, sort of, you know, ostracized these writers. Um, no writers' bodies have stood up for them. And, uh, I mean, no writers except for you have, uh, you know, has stood up for um, fellow writers who are facing this sort of uh, thing. And even publishing contracts. I know of people whose publishing contracts have been dropped, you know, um, who are generally being treated like pariahs. So speak about that and, you know, within the a a Indian English this is particularly rampant within the Indian English writing space, you know, speaking and writing space. So talk mm. about that. Personally, I have refused to accept an invitation from any lit fest uh, which has, uh, you know, come under the orders of Me Too to ban any male writer who has been mentioned, any, any man who's been mentioned by Me Too. And I think this whole campaign has reached absurd limits, which is doing terrible damage to men who've done no wrong. Uh, and uh, I happen to know two of them personally who've been named like this. It's just not on in a democracy that you destroy a man 
you destroy his reputation, you destroy his chances of getting published, um, simply because you said he sat on your jacket or something similar and as ridiculous as some of the, the uh, announcements that I see, uh, very unlike the example I've just given you yes. of the kind of woman I should like to see uh, put in the news, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, uh, uh, and her story made public. Mm -hmm.